just as clarification, I did not do it all by myself. <laughs> um, there was actually a lot of people, a lot of people involved. But with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure being here. Thanks, my NP, for for inviting me in. Um, I have to thank Megan also for the catchy title. <laughs> and uh, for the next 45 minutes or so that I'm allocated, I'll actually talk a bit about our journey. I do some comparisons uh, know, between Finland and uh, Canada, especially the Atlantic provinces, and uh, talk about some of the things that we learned and maybe those to, 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 the, to sort of give an idea what, what things to try and perhaps what things not to try. So, so basically, it's, it's a four-part presentation. I'll start with introducing the bioeconomy in Finland and also drawing some comparison to, to where we are right now. Uh, then I'll talk you through the, the process that we actually took to, uh, to develop the strategy and also the first steps of implementation. Uh, we were able to implement it for about a year, and then we had a change of government. Uh, typically, with a change of government comes change of policies. Uh, we are not any exception in Finland in that. Uh, the, the new governments have new priorities and actions, and I'll talk about those. Uh, basically, it is the incumbent government that are still hopefully in power, where they are hoping that they will be in power for two more years. Then we'll see what happens after that. And then I'll draw some conclusions, uh, some of the lessons that we learned, and also some indications of where we are heading and where we actually need to, to improve our game. So if I start with the sort of the trivial things, we and you, we are two sparsely populated forest covered regions in, in north, relatively speaking. Uh, from our point of view, you are in south. <laughs> uh, because that latitude here is actually 60th latitude. And Finland extends 1300 kilometers north from that. Whereas you guys, if I look at the map of Europe, you are somewhere here. But, but still, it's a relative, it's a relative position. Uh, we both have uh, big neighboring countries. Uh, enough of that. <laughs> uh, Size-wise, pretty similar. Uh, now looking at the Atlantic provinces, uh, population were about twice as much as you guys, but still a very, very sparsely populated country. Most of that population is actually here. Um, there's one big difference. Uh, you, as part of Canada, the Canadian government gets it. The Canadian government gets the fact that especially forest, the bioeconomy is important, and especially forest-based bioeconomy. I will be talking more about forests because Finland, as I used to tell people, it's, it's a country which has one forest, uh, no, several tenths of south of the lakes and few people in between. <laughs> but you, actually, the whole Canada gets it, but the whole Europe does not get it. If you, if you look at the countries, the, the Norway, Sweden, which are here, and Austria here, are probably the only countries that get the, the value of forests. For the rest, bioeconomy means agriculture. The, the use of agricultural side streams for, for whatever you want to do, chemicals, materials. But they actually see, in many, in, in many ways, they see that forests are there to be preserved. The trees are to be hugged, if we want to use a popular expression. Which, which uh, from a policy point of view, of course, creates all sorts of challenges for us because we are part of the European Union, a lot of the legislation actually is derived from the European Union. So we are getting into all sorts of discussions about sustainability. How much can we actually harvest? Is it okay to use biomass for energy at all? And that sort of questions. And I'll get back to those in a, in a, in a bit later. So, and also, of course, one of the, uh, the unifying things about the Canadians is that we both are hockey. <laughs> Sometimes you are better than us, but... <laughs> Uh, actually, for, for I mean, Finland is, uh, as an industrialized nation, we are probably the most dependent on our bio-based resources than any other industrialized nation. Uh, we have a long history of, of uh, pulp and paper industry. We also have a long history of, of machine industry that's been supporting the, uh, the pulp and paper industry. And at some point, not, not that far time ago, maybe 20, 30 years ago, uh, the forest sector actually accounted for about 80% of our exports. And even today, when we're looking at the, uh, especially the forest sector, and, and some of the other things that we export, which are made from uh, bio-based materials, it's still about 26% of our exports. So it's about 12 billion euros per, per, per year. 
Uh, why this share is so high is, is not necessarily because we have a booming by economy, we do, but it's because we had a demise of our, our electronics industry. You know, you all, everybody knows Nokia, everybody knows what happened to Nokia. That used to be the biggest single exporter of Finland. Uh, the turnover, the annual turnover that we have in this business is about 65 billion euros, and that excludes some of the the sectors that I'd like to see associated at least with bioeconomy. First is the technology. The technology industry is the, the machine manufacturers, the, uh, the boiler manufacturers, paper machine manufacturers, the IT companies that serve the, the bioeconomy. They are not included in this, in this figure. And the other one is, which is getting more and more, at least in Finland, more and more prominent is the service sector, and especially tourism. Because again, the, the forests can be a great source of raw material, but they are also a great source of recreation. And uh, because of the climate change that we are seeing, at least in the northern latitudes, uh, there are fewer and fewer places in, in the world where you can experience snow. And Finland, northern Finland, is still one of those places so that we are seeing, for example, Chinese getting in there like in, in masses. So, so. If we, if we take the, the, uh, the technology and the service sector, the, the, uh, the turnover would be bigger. Share of employment, about 11% of the Finns are employed by the bioeconomy. Of course, a lot of that is in, in primary production sectors. Agriculture, forestry. And uh, as, as we know, what's happening in the employment in those sectors, you know, the lots are getting, getting bigger, the forests are getting bigger, they're getting more automated. So really the challenge is now that uh, it's very hard to it's easier to, to actually increase the turnover, make more business, but because you need to do productivity gains, how can we actually make the employment in this sector grow? Is, is, a, is, a, is a thing. When we were writing up the, uh, the strategy, we set up a goal that by, in, uh, by 2025, which is what, 28 years away, the turnover should be around 100 billion euros. And again, that is a possibility. But uh, to have 100,000 more jobs is, is really difficult. And this is the, uh, probably the biggest difficulty we have when, we, when we're especially talking to politicians who are really concerned, for right reasons, they're concerned about employment. But this is not the, the sector. You have, to, you have to find sort of parallel sectors, the, the service sector, the technology sector, the ICT sector that actually serve these, this production. That those will be the sources of new employment, not the production of, of the materials and the sourcing of the materials itself. If we look at the, uh, the output, how it actually is, uh, is spread out, you can see that uh, the forestry industry is actually over 40%. <coughs> so we have a, a, a strong forest-based sector. The energy sector, which now includes, does not include now the, the energy produced by the, the mills themselves, but it's actually the, the utilities using biogas fuels, is about 7%. Construction, of course, use of um, two by fours and others. Wood construction is actually a thing that is, is gaining great traction in Finland at the moment. And that is increasing. That's about 15%. And food, even though we are not a, an agricultural land, I mean, we're so far up north, there's not really a prime land for agriculture still that accounts for, for quite a bit of, of our bioeconomy. economy. But uh, as I said, I will, I will today concentrate more on the forest side because that is the one that's also more controversial when it comes to policies. Everybody, everybody understands that we need to grow food. Everybody understands that we need to increase the value added food. But not everybody gets the fact that we need to use forests for economic purposes. And then some other chemicals, pharmaceuticals, etc. Uh, I don't know if you've done any statistics on bioeconomy. Bioeconomy is a really difficult field to, to describe. Some of, the, some of these numbers are easy to get. You know, pulp and paper sector, you get it. But for example, chemicals. Only a fraction of the fee that goes to the chemical industry is bio-based. How do you actually sort of isolate that out from the numbers? How do you isolate the, the numbers for service sector that specify the, that, that work in the, the bio-based sector? So if you're ever going to, to, to do an exercise, you probably have done an exercise like this, and you probably feel the same pain as we do, it's really difficult to, to sort of measure. And on top of this, as, as we are part of the European Union, the way the European Union defines this is different from what, how we do it. So we need to, in many, many cases, just do two or three different versions depending on who's asked. Uh, this 
I'm showing us to, to show you the, the, the sort of the structure of, of our bioeconomy, especially the forest-based bioeconomy, through a Sankey diagram, so we can actually see the wood flows. Uh, the annual growth in, in Finland is about 100, cubic meter, 100 million cubic meters per, per year, out of which about 25 percent is, is, actually, is actually left untouched, so the annually the stock grows by 25 percent. And we harvest about 60, 70 million cubic meters. The, uh, the, the sustainable, sustainable level of, of harvesting is somewhere around 80. So we are about 15 million cubic meters short of the, the, uh, the sustainability limit. And you can see that actually the, the pulp industries, so chemical and mechanical pulping, are big. And they, of course, then are usually integrated with paper and board. And here you can see that the flows. And here on the, on the right hand side, you can see that the mechanical products. And what we are seeing currently in Finland, that there is a renaissance in, in, in pulping. We are about to commission, a company is about to commission a 1.2 million ton pulp mill in central Finland later this year. There are at least plans for three additional pulp mills in Finland. Which means that there will be demand for this, for the, for the pulp wood. The real challenge is that what do we do with the, with the mechanical products? Because if I'm wanting to grow forest, this is where I get my money when, my, when I sell my trees, not here. So that is one of the challenges that we're looking at. We're not so concerned about what happens to the pulp industry. We're concerned about what do we do with mechanical products? How can we do something else than just buy four and other, other sort of a primary mechanical products? Another thing that you can see actually here is that the, the pulp paper industry is a, is a big contributor to the, uh, the renewable. It is the, the red, red stream here. And actually very little, if any, are used in, uh, for the uh, sort of direct use of, of uh, wood in, uh, in energy production. Most of it is co-generated either by industry or, or, or by the, uh, the communities. One of the, the discussions that we've had, uh, and this is a more of a European thing, is the, uh, I mean, how many of you have heard about circular economy? So circular economy basically means that you're, you're trying to keep material in, in, in flow as long as possible, to retain as much value out of it as possible. And this is now the, the pet project of the, the current European Commission. And basically what they're saying is they want to apply, of course, uh, circular economy also into the bio-based world. Which means that they want to see uh, biomass being used for material products, primarily for material products. And only if and uh, when it becomes a waste, then it can be used for energy purposes, uh, such as power, heat, or even fuels. Now this is something that, uh, that we, don't, we don't believe that such a, a sort of a very theoretical approach would work, what we are actually promoting is, is a way of to utilize the, the, uh, the, the products in a, in, a, in a parallel way. So you actually, you take what we call a one tree approach. That you utilize the parts of the tree, some extractives for example, you can, you can take them out and use them for the really high value pharmaceutical products. But you might have a market of maybe 10 tons or you know, 5,000 tons in the world for that. And then you can come down, and uh, we, we still argue that you should be using, for example, the residues for energy products. And everything in between for, for different types of products. That way, you could actually would get the best value out of it for the society in many ways. The value add, the volumes, and also the ecological and social dimensions. Rather than going for the fact which, which uh, sometimes the uh, I would say that the more theoretical approach that we would use is what, what we call a cascading use. So you make first a, a, a chair, then you bring it up, you make a table out of the, you know, the, 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 then, you, then you turn it into pulp, and then you turn it into paper, and then eventually you turn it into to, to energy. But we see that actually, if you, if you went for that, the overall effect of your bioeconomy for the whole society would be smaller than if you adopt a more versatile, what we call one free approach. And this is a discussion that we, we are constantly having with the European Commission, trying to make them understand this. So, the strategy. 
Actually, the, 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 the process started maybe 2009. Uh, there was a study made for the, well, the government was reviewing strategy on, on, on uh, natural resources in Finland. So we have, it was, which is actually a fairly short list. We have uh, forests and we have some minerals. But that's about it. But in, during, during that time, they were, they were saying that uh, we should actually, we would benefit from a national strategy regarding especially the bio-based materials. So bio, we would need to have a bio-economy bio strategy. It took about two years for the, the politicians and the, the civil servants to, to mull over it. And then in autumn 2012, finally a project was set up where we set up a working group to, with which a task to, to, to write the, the strategy. And that's when I was... Uh, I got involved as a, as a secretary of that, of that working group. And it took us about two years to get it published. It took us nine months to get the text ready. And the rest of the time was to convince the politicians. <laughs> but actually, we were lucky to have that extra year and a bit. Because that gave us the possibility to actually go through some of the the issues that we still had between the different branches of administration. To have those discussions, and actually it was beneficial for the strategy to have this sort of timeout. Because then the major issues were already ironed out, and we were able to, to actually quite swiftly move into execution. You can actually find the, the strategy online. You just have to Google, you know, finish by a strategy, and you can get it as a PDF. Uh, this just to show that uh, it was a truly a multi, uh, I would say, faceted and multi. We had, we had several branches of administration actually taking part. The, the most important uh, minister is actually absent from this list. It was the Ministry of, uh, of Economic Affairs and Employment that was actually took the ownership of the process. It was initiated actually by the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry, but the ownership was claimed by the by the uh, Ministry of uh, Economic Affairs because it was seen the Ministry of Economic Affairs in Finland is, is responsible for both industrial policy and also for energy policy. The fire economy is pretty much about both. So that was only natural for them to take the responsibility. But we had a working group that consisted of these <coughs> branches of administration and also some <coughs> research institutes. We held up quite a few, we had quite a few workshops where we had the, the industries and the NGOs <coughs> and even the, the ordinary citizens were able to voice their concerns or their hopes. And, uh, and in the end, this came out. Uh, the strategy actually is, 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 is pretty much about the, the things and the, the actions that the government can do in order to facilitate the development of biocon. So basically, how can it incentivize certain things and how can we remove certain roadblocks? Uh, it consists of 42 specific recommendations or well, to-do list of 42 items, uh, categorized into four, under four titles. The first one is, is really about the industrial policy, which is probably the most important part of the strategy. So what does the industry want from a strategy is that there are long-term consistent policy or long-term consistent policies that they can sort of just, if you want to invest into a biorefinery, you're stuck with that investment for 25 years. So you want to have some sort of certainty over those 25 years that there will be no reversal of policies, which would basically just take the business away from you. Also for us, uh, the, the two other things that we were, were sort of main things within this was to, to look at the, the legislation and especially the, some of the procedures within the administration. So how long does it get to, to get a, a permission? Does it take two years? That's too long. It should take six months. So how can we actually facilitate the process in order to get the, the, the permissions, for example, for, for, for to, to actually get the permission to build a plant, how can we actually make it swifter? That was the first part. The second part was really about how can we accelerate innovation. Getting from research into new products, new processes, new services, and that was pretty much about financing. And this was probably one of the, the topics where we have possibly failed because of lack of money, but I'll get back to that a bit later. 
The third one was really about the knowledge base. I mean, what we want as, as, is, is, of course, that we want to have bio-based economy, but it also has to be knowledge-based bio-based economy. So you need to have, you want to have these high-skilled jobs. You need to have highly skilled uh, personnel. You need to have highly skilled uh, researchers that come up with the state-of-the-art cutting-edge uh, new technologies and products. But it's not only that, what we actually found out that you have to start already at kindergarten. And we already we did some material which was saying for, for schools to use. Because the kids are tomorrow's consumers. And it's it's in the end it's pretty much about consumer choices, many of these. Does the consumer want to have a bio-based, more sustainable product? Or do, do they only look at the price tag and say, well, I don't really care about this stuff, I'll just get what's cheap. So, 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 inform so, so the communication and, and education are really an important part of the package. And the last one was actually probably the one that uh, maybe is the second most important. Well, it's really difficult to put this in order of importance, but <coughs> usability. So basically, how can we guarantee that there will be raw material for these new biorefineries or the existing ones? What can we do in the forestry side? What can we do when it comes to logistics, when it comes to road network, etc.? In order for the, the industry to be able to draw the biomass at a competitive price. Equally important, especially for us, was to show that whatever we do is sustainable. Because there's a big lobby out there and a lot of concerned citizens who think that bioeconomy is not sustainable. That we are basically just Clear-cutting all the forest, all these squirrels and other mammals will have no place to go. Uh, and it will basically look like a, a sort of a war front. So that is very, very important for us to, to, to show that whatever we do is on a sustainable basis. That whatever we cut, we plant. That we take uh, biodiversity seriously, for example. Those are some of the items that the, the consumer groups are really concerned about. So what did we do? We, we actually, we got this out in May 2014 and we set up to do a few things. I probably need to speed up a bit. Uh, we, we focused on investments, regulation and exports. Investments in order to, to get boost into the sector, to get new investments. But new investments bring new jobs, they bring new export products. Uh, regulation, really, that, that's the first key. How can we make it easier to, to actually be in this business, to, become, to get into this business. And then export in order to boost the, the economics. Finland was really heavily hit in, in 2008. And actually, this year is the first year of, of proper growth for Finland. So we've been sluggish for about 10 years. So that's why we wanted to put extra effort on, on exports. And, and some, of the, some of the things that we did as, as a sort of uh, uh, practical examples of that, we, we started a, a biorefinery competition. I'll get to that in a, in a bit. Uh, we also did uh, work on regulatory surveys, so it's actually see what are the bottlenecks in our regulation that sort of prohibit the growth of the sector. Uh, we, we are in the work of compiling a biomass atlas. I'll show a slide about that a bit later. And we set up export programs for biomass products and technologies. And that has actually been quite <coughs> successful, and as, as far as I understand, you run similar types of schemes, at least at provincial level. And then the communication and media action plan. So we were really uh, trying to create as much visibility as, as possible for bioeconomy to, to get people to feel positive about it. And it's really, it's really easy to get the rural people to feel positive about it because that's, it's really their bread and butter. That's what they do. They get it. But we need to also get the, the urbanites to understand the, the value of bioeconomy. Was, was, uh, was, we claim it's the first of its kind globally. That it actually, it was actually kicked off by the fact that people usually have architectural competitions, right. you know, design an opera house. So why couldn't we have competition around biorefinery? You know, suggest a biorefinery. And uh, so we did. We set up a, we set up an open call for anybody who wanted to set up a biorefinery in Finland. We gave them six months time to to come up with a proposal. Uh, we. And what we, what we promised for them was that the winner would get 100,000 euros cash, plus the three best would actually give uh, a special help from the government to, to facilitate the discussion between all the public and private financiers of the project. Because I guess the same as here in Finland, there are several institutions 
a government agency is providing you uh, funding for different steps, but for different purposes. So they, we were sort of giving them a helping hand, saying that you, we could sort of act as a one-stop shop. We got 12 proposals in six months' time, uh, and they were about, if, we, if all of them were invested, it would be about one and a half million euros. Uh, one thing that we learned on the way, if you, if you ever want to do this type of approach, is to give them more time than six months. Uh, six months is a very short time, especially for the companies that, that were, were asking from outside Finland to, to help to find partners. And in fact, that takes more than six months. But anyway, we got three winners. The, the first one is actually a company that's now in uh, pilot scale. Uh, they are producing textiles, so fiber yarn straight from craft pulp. So basically, skipping a few processing steps and uh, claiming that they can actually do wood-based textiles uh, much more environmentally friendly than before and also 30% cheaper. So they won it. Uh, the second one was actually a very clever idea of a biogas plant that would provide nutrients and also liquid transportation fuels. Unfortunately, that company went bankrupt. That happens. And the third one was actually a pulp mill uh, that was uh, on top of producing sort of some of the more traditional pulp products, but that was actually looking also at, uh, for example, microcrystalline cellulose as one of the products. And that now has uh, attracted Chinese investment. So most likely it will actually be started in, in a couple of years. And as I said, there are a couple of other projects that are going on in Finland at the moment. So the, the, so the investments, there's, this is almost a boom of investments, which is a good thing. <coughs> The, the second thing I'll show up, which, which is something again, which I guess could be replicated all over the place, is, is a biomass atlas, which is just a sort of an interface. As, as you guys, we have been also collecting forest inventory data for a long time. And what this does actually, it makes it available for third parties in public. So creating an interface to the, uh, to the forestry data, and also at some point we'll also have some of the the, the data on, on, uh, on some of the side streams from industries and allows companies to build services on top of this data. So it's like a platform. And then you can have a companies, companies working on, on different uh, sort of service solutions for either individual forest owners or for companies. And this is something that all should open actually uh, later this month. So, after the first year when we did all these things, what we sort of concluded before the change of government, when we were trying to lobby the new government also to continue on this, was that uh, the, the process itself had, had uh, sort of created a, a strong will to develop the bioeconomy in Finland. So actually, when you do approval ratings, we do approval ratings actually uh, for forest space, and forest industries, and forest based bioeconomy, about 90% of the people are saying it's a good thing. Uh, we also were able to, to create a, a very effective uh, operation model between the ministries. We had a sort of a, a small group, a task force that was assigned with the, the execution of the strategy that consisted from, uh, we actually had four people, uh, two from Ministry of uh, Employment and the, or Economic Affairs and Employment, one from uh, Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry, and one from the Ministry of Environment. And of course you can see that there are inherent sort of, uh, I would say, uh, differing opinions between these ministries. The economic affairs always was, you know, we need to get growth, we need to get jobs. Well, the agricultural forest is, you know, we need to you know, get this raw material up from the, out from the, the fields and the forest. And the Ministry of Environment, of course, is then, oh, well, mm, hang on a minute. Should we just let them grow? Uh, but actually, actually, we were able to, to work in a very effective manner. And I think that is something that, uh, that, that is, a, is a, one of the, the most valuable lessons learned. That you need to do this in order to, to really push things forward. Because otherwise you'll be ending up arguing and debating every single thing you do. Uh, we were able to, or partially because of this, and partially because of growing uh, uh, markets in the world for, for pulp, especially for pulp, there's been a very positive outlook for future when it comes to investments. And also, um, 
and we're seeing an increased interest from non-forest industries, especially the chemical industries, to, to tap into some of these resources. And uh, we're also, as I said, uh, as part of the package, there are also some of the public investments into the, into the area, especially when it comes to logistics and transportation. The thing that what we are seeing is that the, uh, the, the traditional industrial boundaries are, are getting really blurry. Uh, here are some of the examples of the, the recent investments that we've done. The, the, the thing is that for, for a single company, let's take a Finnish uh, pulp and paper company, UPM here, which was used before today on, a, on one of the presentations. They are a pulp and paper company, but they're also an energy company, they're also a chemical company and fuel company. So sort of the, the traditional classifications are losing their importance. And uh, that also has an effect on, on all types of things which have been traditionally built along the industrial sectors. They don't hold anymore. And that, that is something that, that the, the industries and especially the industrial associations are struggling with now. So we had a change in government. Uh, fortunately, uh, for, for the bioeconomy, the, the, uh, the party, I mean, we, we always have coalition parties in Finland. We have uh, maybe about 10 parties, none of which get more than 20%, 21, 22% in the election, so we always need to have coalitions. But the coalition was led by a party which has uh, its roots in the rural areas. So they were pretty much pro bioeconomy. And so they set up actually five strategic priorities for the whole government, and, and bioeconomy and, and clean tech was one of the five. And what it basically meant was that they, they, were, they set up uh, five themes under which they allocated extra 300 million euros of extra funding for the government period, which in our case lasts for four years. They allocated 100 million euros for, for uh, investments into new energy technology. Because they, well, I'll actually get to the, the, the energy part in the, in the next slide, but we are really pushing hard to, to uh, get into a lot of renewable energy in, in Finland. Uh, they put some money in, in research and, uh, and uh, digitalization of forest data on the, on the second, which is basically looking at new products, but also finding ways how can we make it easier to move, to get actually the, the wood out of the forest. Uh, Finland has, has also have some of the, the, the promises here. A lot of the forests are owned by private people. We have about 600,000 forest owners in Finland. The average lot size is less than 30 hectares. So you can imagine the, 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 the nightmare of the logistics of, of just one of these companies trying to get all their wood procured in one year. So we are, we're developing uh, electronic services. So basically you can do your, your uh, you know, sell your wood by using your cell phone. That's what's actually, actually starting pretty soon. Uh, circular economy, in our case, was a lot about nutrient recovery. We are surrounded not by an ocean, we are surrounded by a small sea, which is very shallow, has high concentration of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. And uh, for us, really, the, the, uh, the idea is to try to catch most of the runoff, especially from the fields and from manure, before it ends up in the Baltic Sea. But that's where the focus is right now. So a lot of uh, biogas projects being, being built. Uh, food production, so agriculture. Uh, blue bioeconomy is something that uh, the, the, the fisheries, for example, they are the, it is the bioeconomy which is based on aqueous resources. So if you haven't heard that one before, that's a, a very European term. You can freely use that <laughs> henceforth. <laughs> and then on, on nature policy. But really the 300 million euros, 100 million for energy technology, another 100 million actually for farmers, so they would invest in newer technology. So a lot of it, the money went there, and in our view, too little went here, which is really the where you're trying to develop new products, new processes for the market. So some of the, some of the things I'll actually talk about only about the the, uh, the energy policy because that, that is something I guess uh, the the most of the, many of the presentations today touched on on, uh, on bioenergy. Uh, Finland currently has about. 38% of our final energy use comes from renewable sources. And in, in basically in our case, because we are so far up north, it's not solar, uh, there's some wind, but it's bio-based, bio based on the forest residues. And as, you, as I showed on the, on the wood chart, 
there's a lot of the a lot of the energy is actually produced by the, the wood processing and pulping industries. We are also uh, currently have about 15% of our traffic fuels are, are renewables, so both diesel and and, uh, and uh, petrol. So we have both ethanol and, and uh, advanced diesel in, in our in our pumps. Uh, we are going to we are actually trying to achieve 30% by 2030. Now this is partially because of European Union legislation that, that basically says that we need to decarbonize our transportation sector by 50%. So taking 50% of the CO2 emissions from our current uh, transportation sector. On top of the, the, uh, the renewals, it also means that we need to somehow get 250,000 electric vehicles on the road. So it's going to be tricky because they are expensive. Uh, we are also banning, as, as I heard about some of the promises here, are banning coal. We are also going to ban coal by 2030. And we are trying to halve the amount of oil we import by 2030. So there is a lot of demand for now for, for advanced fuels. There's a lot of demand for, for other. So basically what we need to do, we need to, we need to actually invest in all kinds of and then what we are actually, one of the things that the, the government is trying to do, and I'll, I'll get back to that a bit later, is, is trying to find uh, ways to, to help, especially SMEs, so small and medium enterprises, to grow. And uh, one of the, one of the, the, uh, the hurdles that, we, that we've sort of found out is, if you want to get into this business, I mean, it's, it's easy, or relatively easy, if you're a startup and you're working on a computer game or a cell phone game or whatever it is, you just need two guys with little computers and you can sort of scale it up a billion times. But if you want to start producing, for example, uh, bio-based chemicals, you need a process. You need a lot of capital. And how do you actually get that capital? This is one of the questions that I don't think we have properly solved yet. There's very little venture capital in Finland. Uh, the, uh, there, the, the government has fairly limited means in, in providing that sort of investments or investment aid. Actually, the only investment aid we give in bioeconomy are for energy, pro energy pro uh, projects. So if you want to do biomaterials, you're out of that. You're, you're sort of uh, not eligible for that type of uh, aid. So that is, that is something that, that we are still finding as one of the bottlenecks. How can you provide, especially uh, in, the, in the starting phase, you need to build a plant where you can produce enough, for example, materials, so you can you can actually give it out to the next guy in the value chain so they can test it out. And that usually takes something like two to five million euros to, to finance. So where do you finance that? This is a big question. We also, we are, uh, I don't, uh, we are not a, a federal country, but we do have regions, and there are certain regional policies that are listed here. I will not, not go through them all in, in, uh, in the but, but basically, what we're trying to do is to align, of course, the regional policies and the, and the, the national policies. It's easier in our case because the regions are not autonomous or semi-autonomous. Uh, but there is a lot of money coming from the European Union uh, for regional development, which is, which is handed out to the, the regions that are lagging behind in economic development. And even in our case, in the, the period of seven years, which is the funding period, it's several billions of euros. Unfortunately, those, of course, the, the, those are typically the parts of Finland, the eastern and northern part of Finland, which are rich in natural resources. So a lot of the forests are there, but not that many economic activities. And so that's kind of a, a difficult situation, because a lot of the activities are taking part in other parts of the country, but they are not eligible for the funding. So we're trying to sort of kickstart uh, companies, new, new companies in those areas, but it takes time and it takes a lot of effort. One of the things that I would like to actually talk about is the, the importance of public procurement. And again, something that I don't think we've addressed properly in Finland. Uh, of course, because the, the, the government actually can, can play a role in, through public procurement to, to generate markets for new products. We could say that, okay, for, for the, the market size, in, even in Finland, is, is tens of billions of euros, what the, the, the cities, the municipalities, and the, the government actually <coughs> procure for a year. And to say that, okay, we could, for example, for five years, we could favor certain types of things to, to get a kickstart for the markets. <coughs> and then, from there on, they could be, would be on their own. 
We, we started to work on a, on a procurement program. This was funded by the, the, the Finnish Innovation Agency, where, uh, where companies and municipalities could actually, could actually work on, on a new way of, of procuring goods. Rather than just sending out a, a sort of a, a tender, or starting a tendering process, they would be actually have a dialogue beforehand. So the cities and the companies would meet before the actual process started to, to discuss the, what are the, the needs, what could be the possible solutions, and go, in a way, work together to develop the solution. And then they would procure it. But, uh, and we've seen some of the cities Cities in Finland are now getting to be fairly active in this, and I, I believe that cities actually are the engine of this type of uh, of this type of approach. The central government is a bit too sluggish for that, at least in our case. But the cities, but the cities, and especially the capital region of Helsinki, is is, is actually doing a lot, of, a lot of a lot of good things here. When when they are now, for example, uh, procuring electric buses or or starting to have the whole whole uh, fleet of uh, buses in Helsinki are actually converted now to biofuels. So that sort of markets the cities and the, uh, the, the government can do. And there's, there's a great example actually south of your border uh, called Bio Preferred Program by the, by the US government, which is a very good example of a functioning public procurement program. Or at least that, that's how it looks like from the outside. <laughs> I don't know if you have an opinion about that. But, uh, but we, we see it also, for example, when it comes to biofuels, the U.S. Navy has been a, a really great contributor to, to, to getting some of the technologies at scale. So from the uh, one part, of, of course, of the, the policies is the innovation policy. So what sort of, uh, what sort of projects, what, what are the, the, the focuses of your innovation policy? And what we are actually doing right now in Finland is, is we are looking at, uh, on, on high app value and products. We're also looking at the, the effect of digitalization also on bioeconomy and of course on clean tech and other sectors. What, what are actually the, the sort of the electronic, first of all, are there sort of services that could be provided and how does it actually, the, the, uh, the uh, digitalization of everything, how will it actually affect the value chains? How will it affect, I mean some of the trivial examples uh, are that it will affect, for example, the forest operations. And we're already seeing that. We're getting more and more towards autonomous logging, for example. But how will it actually change the markets? How will it change the way you distribute your goods? How people buy their goods? That is probably the, the biggest question to be, to be answered. The way that we've been approaching the, the new developments in the bioeconomy and, and, and also in, in, in larger sense in the whole innovation system is that we are talking about ecosystems. Uh, there, these are a few of the ecosystems that recently have, uh, have been provided funding to, to start developing new products, uh, pilots, into the markets. So you can see that there are uh, three here on the, on the right are, I would call, traditional forest-based value chains. So we're talking about the, the wood fibers. We are producing a lot of cellulose, uh, but we are shutting down paper machines. So unless we want to become a banana republic, just selling uh, pulp to the outside world, we should actually try to figure out alternative ways of, of uh, putting some value at Back home. So now we're looking at textiles, we're looking at composites as an example of wood fiber products that could be produced in Finland. Uh, packaging is, is another thing that, that's, that's still a growing market. Uh, so how can we actually replace plastic in as many ways as possible as a packaging medium and, and use bio-based packaging is, is one of the examples. And then lignin. How do we, how can we get value out of lignin? rather than just burning it to, to develop into products. Then we have some other projects here, uh, just uh, to touch the agriculture side, there's also an, uh, an ecosystem building around insects. Uh, I'd much rather eat fish as a, an alternative protein source than insects, but uh, that's one of, the, one of the things that we're looking at. Uh, we're looking at water. Uh, another one which is, uh, which, is, which is actually very important, which also has been touched here, is the really the waste to energy type of the, uh, like the approach that uh, Edmonton had. But uh, these are sort of uh, looking at alternative raw material sources and how can you actually make, make both materials and energy out of it. And then the nutrient part, which really is related to the trying to save the Baltic Sea from beautification. 
So it's really about the, the ecosystems. The, 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 the funny or, or sad thing is that uh, I just read about your uh, superclusters. We had a similar approach uh, about 10 years ago. The current government thought, nah, and uh, basically cut down the funding for it. And now we're looking at the rest of the world is sort of picking up, and it's, I think it's a, if it works, it's really a good concept. And we're sort of uh, lamenting the, the loss of that, <laughs> that instrument. So sometimes we're too quick to, to stop something. We try to be just a bit too agile and try new things. This just to show the, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the different um, instruments that are available for companies. And it's no wonder that the companies are sometimes a bit uh, mystified. They are a bit at loss with all the possible instruments that there are available for startups, for the growth phase, for going international. But there are several agencies in Finland that are providing these services. We are now in the process of actually streamlining this by, by uh, combining some of, this, some of the agencies together in order to have some some more rational and easier approach, especially from the from the client side, to to, to approach things. But what you can see here actually is that the the amounts of financing available by the by the government are not big. And then again, we are of course we are also bound by the, the state aid rules of uh, European Union, which then limit the the uh, the, uh, the possibilities of actually funding these type of companies, funding for example technology de-risking, etc. And sometimes we feel that we're in a bit of an unfair competition with the rest of the world because of that. And we've seen uh, a lot of the, uh, the technologies that, for example, have been developed in Europe, they have been actually taken to North America for the first production. The first production sites are in North America because of feedstocks, because of uh, also some of the, the, the state aid or the, the provinces or states are providing a, a better financing package than what the European countries can do. So, what have we learned? Uh, first of all, we've, we've learned, and I, I guess you all know this, that it sort of the bioeconomy transcends all traditional industrial and especially administrative boundaries. There's no, there's no one branch that then can take full ownership, but there has to be somebody that takes ownership, and the rest will help. So you need to find somebody that is, is, is willing to, 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 to stick their neck out for that and, and, and fight for the cost. Uh, it's really a lot about industrial and energy policy, that's what we found out, because uh, in our case, one of the drivers for bioeconomy was to, to reduce our CO2 emissions as they were mandated by the European Commission or European Union. The second one, of course, is the industrial approach. We have a large industrial base, which is losing its market. We need to do something, the companies need to do something to diversify. Uh, then what we've seen is, is uh, especially when it comes to bioenergy and biofuel projects, oil is cheap. Uh, the, uh, the European uh, Union has a capital too. I was just checking out the price. It's something like five or six euros per CO2 ton, <coughs> which is basically nothing. Mm -hmm. So there's no incentive. So, so really, if we wanted to get a kickstart into, into in large scale, we need, would need to have some sort of price for, for carbon. And as I, as I understand, in, in Canada, there are several of the, the provinces are having their own schemes, either a carbon tax or, or looking at cap and trade systems, etc. I think that one of the, the important things that we should do and what we try to do in Europe, but not with great success, is to you need to channel that money which you which you sort of collect back to innovation. So you can actually that way be able to to fund some of these new technologies. <coughs> Market-making mechanisms are crucial, uh, especially for these new products. I mean, you need to provide the markets for them to be tested out and uh, to get the, the also the uh, the investors to have some uh, some confidence. And I still think the the, uh, the U.S. Bio Preferred Program is a good example. Also, the biofuel mandates are good. In Finland, actually, being a small country, we actually have three large, or, or I would say, three major biofuel producers. We have Neste. Uh, which is probably the, the largest in the world but when we're looking at advanced diesel. They're producing in Singapore, Rotterdam, and Finland. Uh, we have, but they're using vegetable oils, which are the easiest route to, uh, to diesel. Uh, we have uh, UPM producing advanced diesel, and we have a company called SD1 that produces ethanol from waste and lignocellulosis. And our 
working in the Nordic market. So, so the biofuel mandate actually was, was a sort of a kickstart for, for starting to, to develop. So it actually ended up developing new technology and new technology companies. Uh, one of the things, that, just to say about the scale of these things, that for example, it, this is not very cheap. Then it comes to the fact that what we are uh, quite often uh, focusing on the SMEs, of course. But uh, for example, for Neste to transform their business into bio-based required all, uh, an investment of almost 2 billion euros. So a small company cannot do big things. <laughs> so you need, to, you need to work actually with the interface with the big and, big and small companies. And one of the things also, what you need is standardization. I think one of the good examples, for example, is Lincoln as, as a future or, or, or bio oils. If you want to ship it, if you want somebody to use it, you, you should be able to say that what sort of qualifications or what sort of uh, uh, properties it has. So you need to have some sort of standards. And that is a long and tedious process to do it, but it's, it's, it's still needed and necessary. Uh, technology de-risking is, is really important. And as I said, we haven't really gotten it properly because of lack of some of the lack of funds. But you need to help to, to especially for the technology theories. I think the companies can, can handle the market risk. But the technology risk is something where the, the government can actually step in. And what we are seeing now, and I, I don't know if you have a similar discourse here in Canada, but, but really there's a lot of discussion, there's a lot of skeptics about the what is the role of forests when actually combating climate change, and what is the role of bioenergy. And there's a lot of lobbying out there, even showing that it's better to burn coal than to burn forest residues. So that's, that's a constant, that is that's a threat that at least we have at the moment. Because that would undermine a lot of things that we are actually been investing a long time. And what we really need to do in the future is to, we cannot just be content on what we do currently. We run a, a series of, uh, of scenarios where, we, where we're trying to figure out, also show the politicians that what would be the possible effect on the national economy if we start investing in new products. And the timeline is from 2010 all the way to 2050. And this is the, the traditional part. These are the new value-add products. This is just an exercise to show that if we, if we concentrate on value-add, and this is based on the same level of harvesting. So we are not harvesting more. We are just using the resources more wisely and, uh, and adding up value to them to show that we really need to focus on innovation, on value add products if we want to generate the, the maximum effect for the, for the national economy or the provincial economy. But then you can also, if, you, if you're un, un, uncertain what, what to do next, you can always ask somebody like OECD. Uh, they, they told us what we need to focus on and it's just a couple of things, a couple of things that I would like to ha highlight here. Uh, Really, we should, uh, when we are looking at these new things, we should be forming public-private partnerships. And again, that is something that you are trying to do with your subclusters. That's something that we sort of for, did, and now we sort of uh, abandoned it, and now we had to go all the way to OECD for them to tell, well, guys, you should do it again. <laughs> that, is, that is really the, uh, the, the one of the, the, the main, main ideas. And also, of course, it's also looking at what we are trying to do, and I guess what you are also trying to do, is to try to attract foreign direct investments. And there are several ways you can do it. Uh, first of all, of course, if you, if, you, if you make your raw material available for anybody who wants to use it, if it's cheap and available, that might help. Uh, the one thing that, that we are trying to do is, is, uh, is trying to attract research and development into Finland also. So uh, institutions like us or institutions like your universities can always also be a magnet for foreign companies to invest in your region. So, the, so that's what we're trying to do. We have some good examples, not in this sector yet, but in, for example, the e-health sector in, in Finland, where they actually came with the... It was a combination of policies, it was a combination of the knowledge base that, that sort of attracted companies to, to do that. I think that is, that is one of the, the important things to do for us. So with these slides and, uh, and also Acknowledging that I've already overshoot my time. Uh, thank you for uh, attending, for, for, for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions if, there, if the time allows for it.
have any uh, questions, burning questions? Where do you see? Did you put your hand up, Chad? <laughs> UCI is a teacher of your license learn. And the first one, bioeconomy transcends industrial and administrative boundaries, requires a true multilateral mm. approach, which says to me you've got to get somebody in politics to stand up and say it's a good idea. Yes. And then the last point was um, the role of bioenergy and forests in general and climate change mitigate mitigation divides scientists yes. and is subject to aggressive lobbying. Yes. And you just told my story very, very succinctly in describing that. Yeah. How do you over how do you overcome what you're doing to So basically what we're trying to do, we uh, we recognize the fact that we haven't been uh, we haven't been providing enough scientific evidence to, to, to battle that or fight that battle. The, there's a, there's a, unfortunately, the, the discussion is now more about beliefs than, than truths. And even if uh, some of the groups that we have would produce a paper saying that, you know, if this is not true, actually it has a very positive effect, it might not be accepted by certain groups because it comes from a different, from, from the wrong side of the fence. But that's very unfortunate. And, uh, and also what we're trying to do is we, we're trying to, we should be acting fast. And uh, some of the discussion is that we should actually have to wait and see for a longer time to actually understand what's going on and stop everything while we're doing that. So, so it, that, is, that, is a, that is a tricky question to answer. Even in Finland, there are the, uh, the, some of the scientists are saying that we should, not, we should actually reduce the, the cuttings that we do. Just to answer for the first one, that the, the politicians they also need somebody in the administration to, to take ownership. Of course, the politicians are there, but you need also need to have a you know very a sort of a, a project office that, that starts getting things done. So just to pick up on, on the previous statement that you made about well, some of the scientists want you to reduce your cut. Mm -hmm. you, so you're growing 100 million cubic meters. Yes. Your 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 annual level cut is calculated to be 80. Yeah. You get a buffer there of 20 for yeah. whatever. Yeah. You're harvesting 65. Yeah. So what is the basis for saying that you need to reduce from? Yeah, basically, basically, basically the, the, the argument is that it has to do with the the, um, the carbon cycle. Uh, the the main argument is that if we need to reduce the CO2 emissions now. Because the, basically the carbon neutrality of the of the bioenergy is based on the fact that you know it grows back eventually and within a certain time frame it's carbon neutral. But if we want to do deep cuts now, we should uh, they are arguing that we should actually maximize the carbon intake, <coughs> which means basically that all the trees grow and absorb as much CO2 as possible. But that unfortunately means that we will not be able to manage our forests, and and that would have detrimental effect afterwards, not having managed forests. Because managed forests are the ones that also are the quickest to absorb carbon. Less forest fires, less pests. Exactly. The Mount Pine Beetle, at the height of the Mount yep. Pine Beetle infestation, yep. the BC, the, the pine forests were producing more carbon than, yep. than the... Than the uh, so I was actually I was, so, I was, I was visiting the, uh, the, uh, the government of Alberta last summer. And they were showing some of the graphs in there. The, 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 allowable, the top level was somewhere here. And then they had the spikes, the CO2 spikes from the forest fires, which were about, no. So basically, if you don't manage your forest, then in one, in one instant you can actually release so much more carbon that the other will <coughs> make sort of, you know, whatever has been discussed uh, meaningless. Any more questions? Yeah, Chad, you have your hand up. I'm here only for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we drove over on the bus together yeah. to Miramichi yesterday. And and you made the comment that, uh, gee, I could be, I feel like I'm just in Finland yeah, where yeah. the forest lives. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, looks, it looks pretty much the same. I mean, you, you, know, you have a road, you have forest, <laughs> and you have, and you have the, the, the fence on both sides to me to keep the moose <laughs> moose entering the, uh, the highway. But of course, the, uh, the, 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 the three species are different. So if you get closer look, then it looks different. But you know, from the far, it looks you know, all the same. You guys, you guys have fewer likes than we do. Is this one? Yeah. Hi, can I just ask on sure. the 100,000 jobs you were talking about? Yes. In rough terms, what kind of jobs are they? 
so the, the, the target or the, the existing jobs? The target. The target. That's a very good question. I don't have a good answer for you. Uh, it was based actually the, uh, we, had to, we had to have that target for the, for the sake of the politicians. Because really, and especially now the current government is the only thing they, they worry about are the number of jobs. So, so and then, it was actually based on the fact that we were factoring in a certain productivity gain across the, all, all the sectors. And looking at that, if we increased from 60 to 100 billion, that would translate with these productivity gains into 100,000 jobs. But what we're seeing now is that the, uh, the, uh, the productivity gain is faster than what we anticipated. And especially, a lot of the, the, lot of the existing jobs are in agriculture, unfortunately. Those are the ones that are getting mechanized or automized very quickly. So, so really, the, uh, if, if, we, if, we are, if, if, if I had my way, those jobs would be in, the, in uh, I would say, in high-tech sector, like industrial biotechnology or in the, some of the service sector or, or educational sector, some, something that is sort of a, a high value add or high, high paying jobs. Yes. Uh, I was going to ask one question on the, uh, the biorefinery program in the pulp and paper industry. Yeah. Knowing the wood, it does have so many components. The hemicellulose is there, the cellulose is yeah. there, the lignin is there. Yes. And uh, yet, uh, what I understood, they're only focusing on making pulp again and uh, using maybe the lignin. Yeah. And uh, what happened to the rest of uh, the fibers? The hemicellulose and things. Well, basically, the hemicellulose. If you if you if you have a traditional pulping process, now this gets you know, engineering talk, but I'm sure there's a lot of engineers around. Uh, is this? Uh, I mean, that's dissolved together with lignin in, in a pulping process, and basically goes to uh, recovery water. Uh, the thing is with hemicellulose is you, you you want if you want to extract them, you want to extract them as pure as possible. <laughs> and I I'm not a chemist or chemical engineer, but I guess it's uh, it's easier to get uh, lignin out of it than the then the lignin is more used than the hemicellulose. So really the hemicellulose just go along with the uh, with the lactic acid to recover when it's very there. So. And it's not even a great energy source because it has so much oxygen. So it's really it's really the technology. I mean they look the, the companies see now that there's a market for especially because we do long fiber soft wood pulp. There's a market. And basically if you want to invest a billion euros in something, you invest something that's already applied. <coughs> And uh, most of the things that we're talking about, the more advanced uh, sort of separation technology, where you take take in the, the hemicellulose and lignin as, as a as more pure compounds, are still in the uh, in lab and pilot stuff. You said that you're shutting out paper machines, but you're building two new pulp mills. Yes. Of course, we've been losing pulp mills here. We have basically the same kind of uh, high cost. What's driving two new pulp mills in there? Uh, apparently, the uh, uh, the markets basically. Um, they see that the, there's there's a growth in the markets. Uh, they see that there's uh, you know enough large enough availability of, of pulp wood available, and basically done the math of it. In, in their view, it's, it's still profitable. And, and is it craft pulp? Yeah. And how many new pulp mills are they building in Russia? Uh, they building in Russia? Uh, I don't know. Russia is a bit of a uh, Challenging in the world for, for investment. Uh, just to just to say about the actual pulp mill, uh, which is kind of nice about the new pulp mill that's being built. It, it is a pulp mill, but basically there are several companies. They're sort of invited to companies to to come and use their side streams. So there will be a, a, a company using their sludge, for example, for biogas. There will be a company uh, using some of their fibers for for composites. So they're trying to build a sort of a, like industrial park around it. Co-location. Yes, we, um, you, you just developed a new strategy yes. for the for the country. So, and and you've got that more or less sold to the politicians right now. I understand. So, yeah. have, have they bought into it to make it a long term strategy? Yeah. <clears throat> um, we'll find out in two years. <laughs> I, I mean, that's an honest answer because uh, yeah. every time, it, it's, even the current government. That, that came in at one year after, wanted to have things their own way. Uh, they were basically you know, ignoring the whole bioeconomy strategy, yeah. initially. 
until they, they sort of uh, came to the conclusion that, huh, somebody's actually be thinking about these things before. So it's, it's really a sort of, a, that, that's, that's one of the, the things that, I'm, you know, it could be, a, I don't know what the flavor of the month is yeah. in the next election. So that, that is one of the worries with something that takes a long time to develop. Okay. Where, where the politicians are after jobs, for example, and there are no you know, short-term large gains in anything like this. So is it, do you feel that you're starting to gain a bit of champions within some of the political? I know you've got a large number of different politicians yeah. in your. Uh, there, there are, there are actually uh, the the, um, and they, they actually come from all parties. So all parties in, 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 in principle are for this. Yeah. Some of them more passionately, some of them less passionately. So I'm so I'm sure it will in, in some ways it will continue. But as I said, if there is a sort of a new flavor of the month that comes in that promises more jobs and, and uh, you know, better things for the climate, they might jump that bandwagon. Yeah. Why some of the people use the whole industry of using fresh harvest? Sorry, did you say? Why some are considering using coal? Ah. No, it's, it's, it's basically just an, just an example that they'll be showing the looking at the. I mean, if you, if you do the worst case scenario that you, I guess that you you harvest the forest, your forest somewhere where you, which then emits methane into the air, and uh, and do all that type of calculations, I guess you could make a point that in some cases coal burning. It's it's not about it's not about somebody wanting to burn coal. Basically, what they want to show is that there's no point in burning biomass. That's the point that they're trying to make. You mentioned a couple of things. I wonder if you have some more information on what sure. was, um, you know, how you uh, part of the strategy to spend some time in schools educating 